presented by members of the Syracuse, New York class. My name is Sharon Welch and I'll be your moderator for this class. This is a school and not a church. Neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non-denominational, religious and scientific research organization dedicated and shown proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school is a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in 1958. Since that time, we have established brand schools throughout the United States, Canada, and other certain foreign countries. The Syracuse class was established in 1969. The dean of the Syracuse class is Dr. Patrick Trevison. Our president is Dr. Robert Welch, and the vice president is Dr. John Cometti. In this school, we teach by the true and correct and original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been mistranslated to read Lord. The true title of the Word or Son is Elohim. It has been mistranslated to read God. And the true name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been mistranslated to read Jesus. Now, Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, states in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and that there are God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means that is the title that the creator chose for himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by the letter J. Neither was there a letter J in our English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah. Making such names as Jesus and Jehovah improper renderings of the true name of the Father and his Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit. And in that state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have that cloud painted all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on the chart abides within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Now, Yahweh, knowing that man cannot perceive of him in that pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself, known as Yahweh Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being that is the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form can only be seen in divine vision and understood in divine revelation. Later on, that self-same spirit manifested himself and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world erroneously calls Jesus Christ. Now, there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question we must ask ourselves is, what was the name? of the Messiah at the time he walked the earth plane. A further understanding of the name and title can be had by reading the preface of a holy name Bible. <clears throat> also in the school, we teach by a divine pattern. It's called a divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, 
he called Moses on top of Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. He instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness. This tabernacle pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. We also go about in this school to show proof how that everything in the universe abides within that pure spirit threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. <clears throat> Our 10 primary constitutional aims and objectives are as follows. First is to help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim as he really is and actually exists. Second is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote a study of the scripture, comparative religion, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensation and ages. Seventh is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons, operating in the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensation of time. <clears throat> Eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered to the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth is to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained. There is no other name given among men whereby men can be saved, save in the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new world state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is speak the truth. At this time, we'd like to have the class dedicated in prayer uh, by Dr. Tony Pagano from our, our, our port class, Gates class, I'm sorry. And uh, that'll be followed by a scripture, which is Jeremiah 10, 10th chapter, verses 10 through 15. And that and all scriptures will be read by Dr. Scott Miller and Dr. Deb Cometti will be our other reader for this class. Dr. Pagano? Uh, yep. Um, let us all bow our hearts and minds um, and just... Thank Yahshua for allowing us to be able to sit and listen and hopefully learn something more about him um, that we can, you know, fill in um, something that we maybe didn't know or didn't understand. Um, let's all just, you know, be thankful that we're sitting here and that he's given us the ears to hear something um, and that he's with us daily, um, helping us to walk in his statutes. Um, and with that, let us all say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, good evening and afternoon class. Tonight's scripture will be read out of the Holy Name Bible, containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testaments. Critically compare with ancient authorities and various manuscripts revised by A.B. Crane at the Scripture Research Association. Jeremiah, the 10th chapter, verses 10 through 15. No, it's supposed to be verse 1 through 15. Right? 1 through 15? Okay. Uh, Hear ye the word which Yahweh speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith Yahweh, learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. 
They deck it with silver with, and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it in them to do good. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Yahweh, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee doth it appertain. For as much as among all the wise men of the nations, and in all their kingdoms, there is none like unto thee. But they are altogether brutish and foolish. Their stock is a do <clears throat> excuse me, their stock is a doctrine of vanities. Silver spread into plates is brought from Tarshish, and gold from Uphaz, the work of the workmen in the hands of the founder. Blue and purple is their clothing. They are all the work of cunning men. But Yahweh is the true Elohim. He is the living Elohim and an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble and the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. Thus shall ye say unto them, the deities that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under the he these heavens. He hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings with rain, and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures. Every man is brutish and is without knowledge, every founder more contemptible than his graven image, for his molten image is false, and there is no breath in them. They are vanity and the work of errors. In the time of their visitation, they shall perish. That's Jeremiah, the 10th chapter, verses 1 to 15. Thank you very much, Dr. Pacano and Dr. Miller. Tonight, we will have a three-speaker format. Each speaker will get approximately 35 minutes, and there will be a sign uh, stating your five minutes. Please acknowledge that you've seen the sign. And for our first speaker this evening, I'd like to call on Dr. Rochelle Morgan from Illinois. Dr. Morgan. Good evening, class. Good evening. Um. <laughs> Uh, it's always good to have a testimony of the things we've learned since coming down to the school. And um, I love the prayer that the young lady gave, you know, that Yahweh gives us the ear to listen because we're, everybody doesn't have that. How do we know? Because our schools are not overrun with people, meaning we can invite our friends and our relatives down and Yahweh just doesn't give them an ear to listen. And when they do listen, they think we say the same thing over and over again, or they think we're preaching doom and gloom, as opposed to taking the doctrine and the things that we're telling them and going back to their own habitat and do some research. When we tell them about the names and, and we find out they have to learn just like we did, I didn't know the names coming in here. And when someone told me in school about the names, that's when you do your own research and Yahshua will reveal it to you if that's in his will, you know? And I like, I think the other night, Dennis Volpe was talking and he mentioned, he said the best, oh, it was Chuck. It was Chuck from Florida down in Tampa. And he was saying the best, or well, one of them, and the best thing that we can do when we try to introduce someone to the school is not to tell them so you are going back and forth, who's right, who's wrong. Just bring them down to the school where they're sitting down on a seat and they have to listen. We do tell people to listen. If you have questions, just write them down and we'll deal with that afterwards. But at least they're sitting there and they're listening or they're sitting there acting like they're listening, you know? So that's how, um, that's how I was brought in class. I had to sit there and listen to things that I knew nothing about. And so you come down here and you realize 
that uh, we use tools like the Bible to try and express to you that the Bible is not a book of right and wrong. It's just a history of the creator has given to his cre creation, to his creatures about how he is and how he actually exists. And so since we use that tool, that may turn off some people because they may not even want to hear what's going on in the Bible. They think the translators have made so many mistakes and they just don't want to deal with the Bible. But if you are sincere and you want to know the truth, then you have to use the tools that he's laid for us. And that book happens to be a tool. Growing up in a Catholic environment, I wasn't taught to read the Bible. I didn't learn until I came down to this school that the Bible is written the first five books are called the law. The remaining 34 books are called the prophets. And then what they call the New Testament is really just the fulfillment. And in the scripture, it tells us um, why is that so important? Can we get um, Isaiah 8 and 20? Because that's our foundational piece. And this is how we can see who's telling the truth and who has a misunderstanding. Can I get Isaiah 8 and 20? Isaiah 8 and 20, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And see, that's what it's saying. To the law, which I said were the first five books, and to the testimony of they. That's anybody that's talking to you. And what I like about that being anybody that talks to us, because one of our aims of the school, I think it's the fourth aim uh, about race, creed, sex, caste, or color. Can someone read that, please? to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religion, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. And then what's the one where it talks about race, creed, sex, caste, or color? Uh, two, to two. form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in okay, Yahshua so the really... Messiah uh -huh. without Continue. distinction of race or nationality creed, sex, caste, or color. Now, that's a very powerful aim for me because it says we're developing, we're trying to get a, uni what is it, universal? Say that again, please. To form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity. Now, see, the world is not trying to form a universal uh, brotherhood. A brotherhood of humanity. That's the last thing they're thinking about. So here we're saying we're trying to form that. And when you're trying to form that, it, it eliminates all those adjectives and prejudices that we all may have come in with. What's the other part of that? To form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. So we're trying to do this in Yahshua the Messiah. So since the world doesn't believe in names or anything and the importance of names, and they're saying they think they're trying to do this in Jesus, but they're not. No J, no Jesus. But what really turned me on, we're trying to do this in Yahshua the Messiah, who's our savior. And it freed us from all those other things that the devil uses as tools to always um, keep us separated. And Yahshua is not trying to keep us separated. He's trying to put us back together. Now, that's a very powerful statement. If you don't know how all of this started, then you won't know how we all got separated and why we were separated. And the purpose of doing that, we I've come to learn that Yahweh has a purpose. He's got a pattern or plan of salvation for the soul of mankind. And I was taught in this school not only the importance of the name of Yahweh, in his pure spirit state. And that's, um, you know, when, and the Bible says that God is spirit and, and that go and get John 4, 24, please. Because see, we were taught what spirit is. And the churches that didn't teach me what spirit was. They only had um, their concepts, theories, and opinion of what they thought spirit was. And why do I say it like that? Because they didn't have a divine vision or divine revelation. And without a prophetic vision, the people perish. That's in the book too. And that's why it's so important that Yahshua at the end of each age and dispensation has always come in to save some souls before utter destruction. 
And the world knows that utter destruction is right at hand and they don't know what to do. Well, we are fortunate that we were called and invited. And that's why I like the prayer she made. We were invited down here. We were called down here by the Holy Spirit to learn something more that we thought we understood or didn't understood just to fine tune things. And that's why we come just like regular school. You go to school to better understand the doctrine. And that's what we're doing down here. So I asked for a scripture, did I? John, John 4, 4 and 24. Yes, sir. Yahweh is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. See, it didn't say, and all that worship him. Yahweh is coming to save his souls that he has predestined from the foundation of the world. Those are the souls that he's talking about. You know, over in John 17 and 1, he talks about that. But he's coming in to save the souls that he has predestinated. Can you read that again? It said, uh, Yahweh is spirit. And they that worship him. And those are the ones that, if you're fortunate, you are a recipient of the Holy Spirit. And they that worship him. And there's a prescribed way. You must worship him in spirit and truth. Now, you on your own can't do that. I didn't even know the creator had a name, let alone as to how I go about to worship him or to identify with him. And there's a prescribed way to do that. That's how we all like, what is the day, Wednesday? And most of us, we know we're having class on Wednesday. You gear your day towards that. You're like, I've got so much to do, but by seven o'clock, I want to be done with everything so I can sit down and give my undivided attention to learn something about my creator. And I say that with a humble heart because a lot of, of uh, people have retired. And if we haven't retired yet, we're still working like dogs out here. So for Yashua to put that zeal in us Wednesday morning to say, no matter what, you get together so you can come to class and be a part of this body and hear some more about the creator. That's exciting. And that's why I'm so amazed when people act like class is nothing and they didn't get nothing out of it. It's an impossibility. I mean, I've been coming to class and I get excited. I'm like, wow, I wonder what is Joshua going to say tonight? And that's the zeal that we have. He puts that in us to want to know him and, and love him. So that's why we come down here. So they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So we always start off by telling you this is a divine vision given to our founder. We're not worshiping a man. We're just saying Yahshua used a vessel to tell this to. That's why our ministers and priests and other you know, religions, their rabbis can't tell you because they didn't get a divine vision from the creator. You know, you, yeah, some of us have uncles that said, well, I was called to be a, a, a minister. And you're like, called by who? Called by what? And if he called you, did he introduce himself to you? They don't come with the name. They just say they were called by God to preach what? Uh, erroneous doctrine. And that's what they end up doing. They don't realize that the stuff they're preaching has been fulfilled, those cardinal ordinances. And they're trying to put us all back under that law. They don't realize all that stuff is fulfilled, you know? And so, so much has, even with my short little testimony, so many topics have been touched on. That's why it's important that you come down here with an open mind and, and come down to listen. So I, I'm just going to stick with the name of Yahweh and Yahweh is spirit. And spirit is made out of what makes spirit up is the attributes. And the attributes of spirit is intelligence, wisdom, knowledge, beauty, love, justice, foundation, power and strength there is only one spirit and it has two manifestations he takes on the shape and form as Yahweh Elohim and in that state as Yahweh Elohim that's when he created the creation he first got himself into he turn he tells you what I am which I think is so amazing Yahweh Elohim is a pattern and on our mosaic chart it says um, Yahweh Elohim, the archetype, and that word archetype means original pattern of the universe. I didn't know that our creator was a pattern, but he goes about to show how am I a pattern? And that's why we use the scripture Romans 1, 19 and 20. Can we get that read? Romans 1, 19, because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them for Yahweh has shown it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, 
being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now, that's a whole lot of sense because that which may be known. And the world, you know, I was taught, I'm not going to know anything about God. I didn't know he was a pattern until I die. That part of the doctrine that Christianity teaches is incorrect. You have to know your heavenly father now while you're let, while you're still in the flesh. Just like with school, you don't wait to graduate to start learning your ABCs. You have to go through those eight years of learning the basics about education and what they're trying to tell us in words and letters and math and all that stuff. And then you graduate. In this case, we're talking about something spiritual. You have to know your creator. And the word know means to, that you have a knowledge of him, you have an intimacy with him. Simple words that we took for granted, simple four-letter words. And how I know what that means is I would have to take you back to Adam and Eve. It says when Adam knew Eve, she conceived. That's intimacy because she brought forth a son. She brought forth an offspring. So this is very the word metaphysical means to study beyond the physical body. So when we come down here, we do have to give our undivided attention to this doctrine and pay attention to what the speakers are saying. And it's okay if I make a mistake, I'm not perfect. Hopefully if I make a mistake, the next speaker can go in and say, hey, let's clean that up a little. And I'm not ashamed. And, and that's the wonderful thing about being in school. You can have somebody tell you, hey, that's not how that should have been worded or there's a better way to say this. Don't get to the point where you think you know everything and everything you're saying is just the gospel. Yahshua teaches us and he, and he corrects us because this is a school. And so then we use that Romans 1, 19 and 20 because that which may be known of Yahweh because over in, I think, John 1, 29, it says that, that they haven't even seen him. They, you know, and things like that. Well, here we're telling you, not only did people see God and they learned something about him, you know? So these are the things that we're talking about. I'm just dealing with the names right now. So here you have Yahweh in his pure spirit state. He takes on that shape and form. And I love the example um, when I was in Chicago, we would always say, if you want to know what's in Lake Michigan, just get a cup of water and put it in that, grab it out the water, put that, fill that cup up with Lake Michigan. Everything that's in Lake Michigan is in that cup right now. It lost, it just, uh, you know, it just took on a shape and form as a cup. So when Yahweh took on that shape and form as Yahweh Elohim, he did not lose any power. That's why he could say, Dr. Kinley said, Yahweh said when he created Yahweh Elohim, he went out of the creating business and everything was left over to Yahweh Elohim, who then defines what is Yahweh? He is a, what is Yahweh Elohim? He's a pattern. The pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place and a court roundabout. Three separate compartments, but one. So that three and one configuration is very important. And that right there took away that a trinitarian concept you've got god over here lord over here and the holy spirit some doing something else we don't teach a trinitarian concept deuteronomy 6 and 4 says here O israel yahweh our elohim is yahweh a unity so we teach a unity concept and that also has to be explained too because people get so confused you know you've got yahweh then when he takes on shape and form you've got yahweh elohim and then when he creates the days of creation, he does a bad pattern. That's why it was so important to go into Romans 1, 19 and 20. So then you've got um, something as simple as water. Water consists of two hydrogen and an oxygen. It's in a gaseous state as water and a steam. Then it takes on shape and form. When you put it in that cup, it takes the shape and form of that is still two hydrogen and oxygen. And as you lower that temperature, it gets really cold. Like um, we were talking earlier, it's getting ready to snow in New York. And that's going to take, in, that's going to tour into that ice. You're going to get icicles, but it's all still water. That's why it's important to know how spirit operates. Because now we're talking about the operation and the structure and the function of spirit. So then he's abstract, intimate, and concrete. And that abstract, that's his name, Yahweh, when he takes on shape and form, that's Yahweh Elohim. Once he does that, Yahweh has a purpose. He's got a pattern, a plan, the plan of salvation for your soul. And the most important, precious thing that we have 
as human beings are our soul. And I believe that we preach the gospel to the saving of a soul. Everybody has a soul. So can I get Psalms 19 and seven and I'll be done with that. Cause we're talking about the saving of the soul. I didn't know when I came into the class that I came in a physical body. So I was body within that body. I had a soul and that soul was governed by a spirit which is universal spirit law. And that's what Yahweh is. Everything that has the breath of life comes in through Yahweh, okay? That's his name. But when we take off the flesh, the flesh will go back to the dust of the earth, which is where it came from, because that's where Adam came from, and that's where we came from. And then that spirit, that spirit, that spirit which is dead, that's why when I came in class, they say when you walk in the room, you are dead on arrival. Well, what's dead? The soul of a man is dead. Then you have to hear a lecture, how did my soul get dead? And what, what, how did that come about? Because I didn't know my soul was dead. And then that lecture will tell you more about that part of what happened. So that soul is dead. And, and we're talking about the creator that I worship and I've learned to know and love, Yahweh Elohim, when he comes in as our salvation, this is um, what they, whom they call Jesus Christ incorrectly. No J, no Jesus. And so Yahshua, the Messiah, is his name because he came from the Hebrew like, lineage. And there's no J in the Hebrew language to this day. Basically, what that means when Mary was calling her son for dinner, she was saying, Yahshua, come and eat dinner. She did not say, Jesus, come and get some spaghetti. It was nothing like that. So then Yahshua comes in because that means Yahweh is our salvation. So then Yahweh loses no power when he takes on shape and form and he comes to the Virgin Mary. And that story is so important right now because, see, the world thinks that they are celebrating Jesus' birthday and they think they're celebrating Mary, his mother. But the real lady Mary knew that Joseph did not get her pregnant. She knew that seed was placed in her. And that was a specially prepared body that they used, which was Mary. Joseph knew he wasn't the father because an angel told him. And they didn't even get to pick this kid's name. Someone also grabbed Matthew 1, 21. But I asked for Psalms 19 and 7, if we can get that read. Psalms 19 and 7. The law of Yahweh is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. And I consider myself extremely simple to this day. It's an honor as this, you know, first speaker that did the prayer. It's an honor to be able to come and talk to anybody about what we're going through now and where was the story with Mary and with Yahshua. And Yahshua names means what? Matthew 1 and 21, please. And she shall bring forth a son and thou the shalt she call she's him. talking about is Mary. Okay, it says, and she, Mary, shall bring forth a son. And what? Thou shalt call his name Yahshua, for he shall save his people from their sin. Now, we, I had to come down here to learn that I, I knew I was a sinner, but I didn't know what kind of sinner, you know. Uh, what's that song, Share of Sings, or somebody, um, I was born in original sin, that kind of stuff. But anyway, I, uh, Yahshua, his, he came in to save his people from their sins. And so that's not something that we're waiting to die to get done. That's something he has the power to do. As you come into these classrooms and you sit on these seats, he's got the power of that dead soul that walked in there. And when, they, when we say dead souls, you were breathing. So you were alive from a natural standpoint. But in that inner man, remember I said you were made of body, soul, and spirit. That inner man was dead. And when you were, what were you dead to? I was dead to my creator. I didn't even know I had a creator. I thought when my priest was telling me about Lord and God, that's the creator I grew up knowing. And then I found out that I was lied to. And, and I understand how that's just hard to believe that people lie to people about something so utterly important as your soul. Because when you die, your soul goes on. It doesn't stop. And so when you find that you've been lied to, Yahshua has a really have kid gloves to take away all those lies and replace, and replace them with the truth. And when you're replaced with the truth, that's when your soul is converted from death unto life. There's a scripture in there also that says, the spirit of truth which the world cannot believe or cannot receive, if you can grab that for me. Because see, we don't teach all because you know the name of Yahweh 
and the title Yahweh Elohim that he gave himself in the name Yahshua the Messiah, that bam, you automatically have the Holy Spirit. It doesn't work like this. It comes by revelation. Everything has to come by revelation. This is that type of school. All because you read it doesn't mean you automatically understand it. That's why some of us can always say, I thought I knew this, but coming back to school after the first 10 years, I know more, like Chuck was saying, the first 10 years, I knew nothing. I'm getting a better understanding as I've gotten older, as I've been ex exposed to more, as I've had to, um, you've got to experience what Yahshua has done. And that's how you grow in your understanding. So I don't have the same understanding I had 10 years ago because Yahshua knew I didn't know everything. I heard Rhonda Brazil talk the other day and she said, Yahshua talked to her. And at first I was going, yes, we talk to Rhonda. Wow, that's amazing. But then he had to bring back to my own remembrance when I first got in class, when I was going to class as a new person. And one day I was at home and I, I was asleep. I thought I was asleep or up. I couldn't tell you. I felt like, you know, out of the body, I didn't know. But Yashua came to my front door and he said, Rochelle, Rochelle, come open the door. And it wasn't until I got up and walked halfway through the house I realized I lived on the second floor and I lived in the heart of the ghetto. So I had a, a lock on my door to get in. I had bars on my door and chains. So he said he had to remove the lock, the boards and the chains, which consists of my concept, my thoughts and my theories of what I thought God was. And I, so Yahshua does talk to us and break things down to us. So if we get excited, I do apologize. This is a life-changing experience. And you won't forget anything that Yahshua has done for you when he's done it on a one-on-one. -on -one. So everybody has a testimony of how Yahshua has come in and converted their soul and changed their lives and made it so much, what? You think we're all happy now? We don't go through no changes now? No, we just have a better understanding of how to react to things that are going on in us and around us. And that is, a, that's a joy. That's a joy to know the truth. That's a joy to know the father as he really is and actually exists. So I'm gonna end on this note because there's so much we have to talk about and so much we have to learn. But I, I, I'm asking the new people, the old people to come down and have an open mind and, and let's just listen to what Yash was telling us tonight and, and write it down and take some notes and, and, and get in your bed and ask him and, and pray and talk to him and be like, Father, help me understand you as you really are and actually exist. And if you got anything, I give all praise honor, and glory to the Father. This is what I was sad to say. And I'm going to turn it back over to the moderator in the name of Yahshua the Messiah. Hallelujah. Thank you very much, Dr. Morgan. Our next speaker tonight, it's a pleasure to call on the Dean of the Artport New York class, Dr. Bonnie Snyder. Well, good evening. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Um, I enjoyed yes. the comments of the first speaker, and I'm happy and glad to be here. I don't get the opportunity to come on because our class is usually on Wednesday night. We didn't have class tonight, so. But oh, good! I'll get on the Syracuse class. Um, I want to go back to Jeremiah uh, ten, but I want to do a little something first, set a little foundation. Um, and get a couple of verses which will show us something um, about how, how close we are to the end of the age. Could I have the, you can put the four charts up. I think maybe I can do it with the ages chart that way, whoever's doing the charts, thank you very much. Um, because one of the things that we've come to recognize is in order to know the purpose of Yahweh, we need to know something about these ages and dispensations. And there's been a lot of stuff brought out about them in the past, like three or four years, things that I never even thought about <laughs> before. But one of the things is, um, you know, we're right down to the end of the age. And even when Dr. Kinley was still in the flesh, um, he was talking about us being down to the end of the age. And there's a 
couple things right in the scriptures that you can pick out that show you that we are at the end of the age. And I'm going to get three verses, and then I want to explain something about the third one, and then I'll get into that, Jeremiah. So that's what my plan is. Hopefully it'll go that way. Um, Matthew 24 and 14, please. And Ephesians, the first chapter, 9 through 13. Said Matthew 24 and 14. Matthew 24 and 14. And see, if you look at the ages chart, you have three ages in time. It goes from eternity to eternity, which is the spirit of Yahweh. And we are in the day of eternity. In fact, time is within eternity. We exist within the day of eternity. We exist in Yahweh's day. All right. So anyway, you have these three ages in time. And at the end of each age, and she already mentioned that, you know, at the end of the ages, something big happened. And we are right down to the end of this age, this fourth age, and we're getting ready to go over into the fifth age. And there's some things that have to happen before this age can end. Just like you have days in the week, you know, there's, you have to go through the hours of that day like today's Wednesday, we have to go through midnight. Well, our time, we'll just have to do it that way without getting all mixed up. We'll have to go through midnight and then start Thursday. You know, you have to go through certain things before you can start a new day. But there's going to be a new day coming and there's going to be a new fifth age coming. Let's see? So Matthew 24, 14, please. Matthew 24 and 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Okay, so this is the Messiah speaking, and this is what he's saying. Um, before the end comes, the gospel of the kingdom is, has to be preached in all the world. And, and he didn't say it had to be. It, the way that he said it was, and this gospel of the kingdom, it shall be preached in all the world and then shall the end come and you know with this and i know i'm just talking about stuff that everybody already knows but i just you know i'll give you what i have because that's all i have <laughs> um you know one of the things you have at the when you had the pandemic that took place and you all of us got you know it's just amazing that we have these classes this way and it's really too bad we didn't do it for years and years because the technology, some of it was there. But um, how that we've picked up and even the simplest, you know, I don't know technology very well, but I know it enough to get on here and to listen and to participate. And what a great thing it is. And you know that we have brethren now all over the world. I mean, you, you know, there's a great list of them. There's people that you know, have classes with people on a regular basis and, you know, to these other countries. So anyway, and you know, there's people that get into our classes on a regular basis. Every once in a while, somebody come, they're from Malaysia, they're from, you know, Africa, they're from someplace <laughs> other than, you know, all around the world. And so you can see that through this uh, venue of the zoom classes and and even youtube and the way that other ways that people do it uh, we are able to get this gospel preached in all the world and you know the gospel being preached and and we know that the gospel is is yashua's death burial and resurrection according to the scriptures are backed up by the law and the testimony that's what the gospel is how that yashua did go through a death burial and resurrection which is right here on this chart where it says the end there and you have that cross, that's where Yahshua went through his death, burial, and resurrection. So you have him going through that death, burial, and resurrection, and that's the gospel of Yahshua as we, and every single, you know, the thing of it is, when you say gospel, a lot of times you limit it to his death, burial, and resurrection according to the scriptures. And it is a definition of what the gospel is. But everything that's written from when Moses first started writing, all the prophets, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the, the, the epistles that were written after the, the book of Revelation, all those things that were written down 
are really written about Yahshua's death, burial, and resurrection. That's the vocal point of the purpose. It's where we have to see that he did this in order to go from one age to the next. And they had to see in order to go from the third age to the fourth age. You know, there was, there was the apostles believed in Yahweh and they had to go there and Yahshua told them to go and wait in the upper room and, uh, or wait in Jerusalem until they received the promise. But you, you had, you know, there's, there's something to that believing what Yahshua did do for us because it was a huge thing that he did. In fact, it was, anyway, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to go and preach on that, but it was, it was a huge thing when he went through the death, burial, and resurrection. And I know that you all know that. It's, you know, no, no secret. <laughs> all right. So um, would you read that one more time, please? Because I want to make a point here. Mm -hmm. Matthew 24 and 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So the gospel of the kingdom or Yahshua's gospel is going to be preached in all the world and then shall the end come. And so the point that I wanted to make is that the gospel of Yahshua had to be preached before the end could come. Before the end of what? Before the end of it. the whole chapter of Matthew, they're asking him, what's going to happen? When's going to, the end of the world going to come? What's, what's going to be going on? And so what you're looking at, when he's writing this, you know, it's written in the, in the third age, but it shall come. So it's futuristic. It's going to happen in this age that we're in. And the apostles, the 11 apostles that were left after Judas went and hung himself, you have, it was their responsibility then to preach the gospel of Yahshua in the beginning of this age. And you know, it was through their preaching at, and believing in the gospel at the beginning of this age, the people received the Holy Spirit both Jews and Gentiles receive the Holy Spirit through the preaching of the gospel. So, and this is just something to think about. If it was good enough to receive the Holy Spirit at the beginning of this age, don't you think it should be good enough on a good enough teaching uh, Yahshua's death, burial, and resurrection according to the scriptures to, for someone to receive the Holy Spirit at the end of this age? Because, you know, one of the precepts of our school is the end is declared from the beginning. Well, in the beginning of the age, they were preaching the gospel. And so at the end of this age, Dr. Kinley has a vision and a revelation. And it's through the ministry, Dr. Kinley, Dr. Kinley's teachings. And that's the, what we teach. You know, none of us have anything on our own. We didn't know what the Bible was until we came to class and saw this vision. We didn't know any of the... We didn't know anything about the creator or anything at all. Didn't know our Bible. Didn't know what, what was our religions were about. Didn't know anything until it was revealed through this vision and revelation. So the ministry is really Dr. Kinley's ministry. That's what we all fall under. And, or that's what we've all been risen under <laughs> would be a better way to put it. So then this ministry then is going to preach the gospel of Yahshua the Messiah. And then shall the end come. You understand? So that is one of the things. That was one of the points I wanted to make is that that gospel has to be preached. And then the end is going to come. So let's get Ephesians. I know I spend so much more time on this. There. Yeah, but anyway, Ephesians go ahead. One and nine. Thank you. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he okay, might now, gather. I'm going to interrupt you. I'm sorry. I, I know it's hard, but it's hard too on this end. So in the dispensation of the fullness of time. So we are right now in the, in the dispensation of the fullness of time. All those six days are going to be done soon. The fullness of time are the six dispensations or those six days. And so what you have is, that's what he's saying here. All right, keep reading, please. Or read in that. the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in the Messiah. Both okay, which so are in oh, that's good. I just wanted you to get that, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he's going to gather all things in Yahshua the Messiah. So right down here, and he, it's been a gathering from Pentecost, from the time that they, that the, 
gospel started being preached at Jerusalem, see, there was a gathering that took place. In fact, the gospel really is the way that Yahweh set up that he would gather his sons and daughters together. You know, it's through the preaching of the gospel that you are gathered unto righteous principles or you're gathered unto him. And that's how you're resurrected and you, you see him and believe in him and receive the Holy Spirit. You know, it's, it doesn't happen by magic. It happens through the way that he set it up. You would hear the gospel preached and you would, you know, take heed to it. And I'm going to talk about it a little about when I get there to Jeremiah. But anyway, you have... Um, the, that gospel is going to be preached and that's how you're gathered together and that's that's not my imagination you know it's throughout the scriptures you know one of the things you have is back under the law you had the calling of the assemblies and i think it's in numbers the 10th chapter and i don't want to go ahead and get all this but i just want you to know where you can find it when they called the assemblies they had silver trumpets and they blew them and you know that you have your bucinator, and I've talked about this before, but it is something that's very necessary to know and understand. When that gospel is preached, that's the blowing of the trumpets or the gathering together of Yahweh's people. Under the law, he did it with a physical trumpet, blew the trumpets, and whatever sound it was, they knew how to gather and what, what the gathering was going to be for. Sometimes it was to move, sometimes it was for a convocation. You understand but that's what it was for it was for the the gathering together of the people and so this great spiritual gathering that has taken place from pentecost on now till now through the preaching of the gospel we're gathered into yashua through the preaching of the gospel you hear these things about and you you're going to hear things in the school and understand things in the school you never even, it never even crossed you, just like the name of Yahshua. It never crossed our mind that, oh, the Savior's got a different name than Jesus. You know, we just didn't even think about things. It was not in our realm of even questioning things like that. You know, we all just were just kind of brought in, sat down and heard it. And we're like, some people just were chosen to say, wow, I see this. <laughs> You know, and, and we, we do need to be grateful if we do see, because not everybody is, sees it, just, you know, and there's reasons for it. Okay, um, so anyway, I wanted you to see that that was that gathering, and that was one thing that was going to take place, be all through this age or before the end comes, he's gathering all his own into his own body. He's gathering us up into his own assembly. We are his bride or his assembly, all right? And that's how he's gathered us through the preaching of the gospel. Now, I want one more verse about um, something that's going to happen before the end comes. And that is 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter. And I, I think I want you to start right at one. 2 <clears throat> Thess, 2 and 1. Now, we beseech you, brethren... By the coming of our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that day of, the, of Yahshua is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Okay, would you read that last verse again, please? Let no man deceive you by any means. Mm -hmm. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. So the and day of Yahweh, the, the end of the age is not going to come. And, and you know, it's we, we look at it as being a day, the day of eternity, but Really what you have is the day of Yahweh's appearing. He's always been here, but he doesn't appear to everybody right now. But universally, he's going to appear to everyone at the end of this thing. You understand? And so, I just you know you say you understand nobody. I don't know if anybody's with me or not. I'm hoping so. <laughs> so anyway, 
then go ahead and keep reading, please. Yes, and it's beautiful. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, love. Uh, for that day shall not come except to come of falling away first. And that man so that of sin, day of Yahweh is not going to come until there comes a falling away first. And that man of sin, keep reading. And that man of sin be revealed, the son and of perdition. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And you know that perdition means the irreversible loss of the soul. Well, we are none of them that draw back to the loss of the soul. We're not them. We're them that believe to the saving of the soul. And by the way, that verse, let's get that one verse before I go on any further. It's, um, uh, where is that? Hebrews 11.39, maybe? No, maybe. <laughs> if anybody knows where it is, could you help 10, me out? 10.39. 10.39. 11.39. And these all, having received witness through faith, faith received not the promise. Somebody, had that, having... somebody said it was 1039. No, 1039. 1039. But we are not of them who draw back. Oh, unto oh, one verse, Deb. Deb, go up maybe Again? one. The just shall live by faith is where I want you to okay, start. Okay, 38. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Now the just are going to live by faith. And that's it all through the scriptures. The just live by faith. Abraham was found to be justified in Yahshua way back in the beginning of faith. You understand? So the just shall live by faith. Read. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. If any man draw back from that faith. Yahweh's not going to have any pleasure in you. See, read. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but now of listen, them. We are not of them that draw back into perdition. We're not of them that draw back into, this, into the irreversible loss of the soul. We're not of them. Read. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. But we are of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Just a second, dog, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> because, and it doesn't say there that you believe in the saving of the soul, although we do. But it says you keep believing to the saving of the soul. See, the soul can't be saved without you believing. You've got to believe these things. That's why the thing is taught the way that it's taught. Yahshua the Messiah said, you know, through Paul, that your faith cometh by hearing. You have to hear the gospel preached. You have to see the way Yahweh's done things. And then you, when you see the witnesses lined up and you see all the things that go together in order, for the first time in your life, you have no choice but to believe it or else just turn your back on something that you shouldn't, you shouldn't go that way. <laughs> you understand? Okay, so I just wanted you to see that that falling away had to come. Would you read those last two verses? Not the one I just got, but those last two verses in um, uh, wherever I was. <laughs> Thessalonians. Thessalonians or Hebrews? Thessalonians, please. Got it, Scott? Um, I do. Okay. Second Thess 2 and 3. Let no man deceive you by any man, by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Now that, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And you know, sometimes at people, I can remember years and years ago, people used to come in and they say, I don't know why you have to talk about my church. I don't know why you have to talk about Christmas. I don't know, you know, understand people would always bring up these things. I don't know why you have to, well, you know, it, this verse tells us why. The mystery of iniquity has got to be revealed before this thing's going to go out. And through this teaching, you know, we have learned the mystery of righteousness, which is Yahweh, Elohim, and Yahshua. And we've learned about the mystery of iniquity, working through the dispensations and ages. We've seen him working. You know, we had, you know, Rick did that thing with the 
uh, the mystery chart and you like you see that he has been working through time the mystery of iniquity see and so what right he, there you, we have two great mysteries there's more mysteries but there's two great mysteries the mystery of righteousness and the mystery of iniquity and he must be revealed before the end can come and there has to be a falling away see could we go back to the other charts because i want to show you something about this falling away quick I get off on so many things now that it's pathetic, but um, okay. So if you look right here on the um, elementary chart, you have one, two, three, four. The fifth plate across is your uh, apostasy. Now the apostasy at the beginning of the age that we have, the beginning of the age that we were just talking about, the age that we're in right now, fourth age. In the beginning of the fourth age, the apostate, church was those that left the original teaching and you can tell by the letters that paul and peter and that you can tell by the letters that they wrote that there was stuff going on people leaving who has bewitched you well why would they say that to somebody because they come up with a doctrine so they were people that left the original and really that's where christianity came from they left the original teaching which is yahweh elohim and yahshua and they made up their own religion or went off and you know how christianity came together and you know all kinds of religions are meshed into that uh christianity it was all just a mishmash of beliefs ancient beliefs see all right so anyway and then that that's that apostate church in the beginning of this age so you know if there's an apostate church in the beginning of this age there's going to be an apostate church at the end of the age and you know how Dr. Kinley taught us all about that Catholic church and how that, you know, he was sitting up there saying that he's the son and it's right on the chart there. That's an apostate church. But there is also an, a leaving of the truth that's an apostate church. You understand that at the end of this age. And you can see that very plainly if you look to. And I don't want to get into that, but you, you have those things happening. This apostasy is it. You know, to leave, one of the definitions that I read about apostasy is you're leaving something and you're thinking in your mind that you'll never go back to it. Now to leave something and, and have it in your mind that you'll never go back to it, when it's the truth of Yahweh, that's a terrible place to be in your mind. And we don't want to get mixed up with any leaving the things that we have been so graciously given in this great vision and revelation and this teaching that's been delivered unto us and we have all the tools to stay straight we have the tabernacle pattern that keeps us straight we have the name of yashua you know we have things to keep you straight you don't have to depend on a man you know the thing for yourself see okay i want to get off this preaching i want to go <laughs> i want to go to jeremiah because i know i have probably a very short time and i want to go to jeremiah uh, 10 and 1, please, and talk a little bit about this. And that's the reason why we talk about these things in, uh, in religions and what people believe in and the things that are carried, people carry on in the world with idols and stuff. We, do, we bring it up because it's revealing to you. It's showing the mystery of iniquity working, see, through time and, and how it, it just stayed right with it. All right, I want you to read Jeremiah. Start right at one. Jeremiah 10 and 1. <clears throat> Hear the word which Yahweh speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith Yahweh, learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them. Okay, so I want, to, I want to just stop right here. And it just hit me when I was reading this. You know, we go over these things every year this time of year. And this is something that you, one of the things that we never want to forget about is this is coming right from Yahweh. When Yahweh gave Jeremiah this vision and told him what to write down, he wrote down what thus saith Yahweh. And that's the whole way that your Bible was put together. And it was verifying with what was back in the law. So the law and the testimony, your witnesses that you're looking at to see what it's like. And you see who Yahshua is and also to see the, the things the way they're wrong. You understand? But anyway, this 
I, just the way that he said it right here. Hear you the word of Yahweh, which speaks unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith Yahweh, learn not the way of the heathen. Now this is Yahweh speaking. Learn not the way of the heathen. See? And be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. Go ahead and read. For the customs of the peoples are vain. One cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fashion it with nails and with hammers that it move not. Okay, they so are, right there, and you know, one of the things that we've looked at with this is that's what they do with a Christmas tree. And Christmas tree, you know, it's not only just something people do it, it all over the, you know, it came from Germany, I believe it was, but people do it and all over the country and they cut down a tree and tree is a, it, you know, there's tree farms in this area. It is big business. The people that run the tree farms are doing pretty well. <laughs> all right. So it's, it's a bit, it's a big business to cut down a tree, even though Yahweh said, don't do it. It's the way of the heathen, but yet it's still one of the uh, a custom of the people. They want to do it. It's so attractive to the natural man, the natural physical minded man, just do things that are, and, and even if they're shown sometimes, they don't want to hear this. People don't want to hear that. People don't, you know, there's people in class that don't even like to hear it and hear it preached because they're like, well, we, you know, we're not under the law now and we're, da, 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 and, it, and it's true, we're not under the law. But how about just the way that Yahweh said it? Don't do what the heathen does. Cut down a tree and put it in your house and deck it with silver and gold and nail it down. And you know that's what is happening. You understand? And I just want to read something. Oh, uh, let's see. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want you to, I want to read something out of this little pamphlet. There's a pamphlet that is biblical proof of the true birth date of Yahshua the Messiah. And it's on page, oh, there's no page numbers on here. Well, it's a very short, you can find it. It's a definition of Christmas that they put in this pamphlet. We will copy the explanation of Christmas as written in the National Encyclopedia, page 65, volume three. I'm just gonna read this, it's really quick and you'll get some, you know, you'll. It'll, it'll benefit you. <laughs> Christmas. The Christian religious festival or mass celebrating the nativity of Christ, commonly observed annually by the Western churches on December 25th and by the Eastern churches on January 7th. The date of the Western Christmas fell on a day which to the Romans was sacred as Natalis Invictus Salus, and I'm, I can be, you know, obviously corrected on that pronunciation, but of Mithraism and to the angels of early Britain as Motra Nat or Mother's Night in connection with their Druism. And I, I think most of you know what Druism was. It was pagan worship. Before the fifth century, there was no common acknowledgement of December 25th as the Christ, Christ Mass, and there was no agreement on the date of Christ's birth. Even in the earliest mention of the day, there is nothing to indicate that it was kept as a festival. In 1644, the Christmas observance was forbidden by act of the English Parliament by Charles II, revive, oh, oh, excuse me, let me read that again. The Christmas observance was forbidden by act of the English parliament, but Charles II revives, revived it at the restoration. Though the people of Scotland and some of the colonies of New England adhered to the Puritan rule not to observe the day. So there were people that stuck out and recognized that it wasn't even a holiday that should have been observed, right? All right, I'm gonna finish reading this. 
Today, it is commonly observed with religious services, greetings, gifts, and hospitality, in the last of which the entire population, irrespective of religious affiliation, joins in. And that's the end of the quote from the, from the National Encyclopedia. Well, I think they, they kind of overstepped it by saying everybody did it because the entire population obviously didn't do it. But um, it's very interesting to see that today it's observed, even though they recognize and admit that it's not the day that he was born. And they say they're celebrating, and this is another thing, and this is something we've known and we know it in the school, but it, it's something to really think about. Christ's Mass. Christmas. It's a prayer for the dead. That's what mass is. So you're saying a prayer for the dead instead of a prayer for he's being born. And that right there is so like an obvious error in their thinking of things, you know, and just the fact that they put all these pagan holidays together and did it. So what I'd like to do is just quickly, as I know my time must, must be almost up, is go to um, a couple of verses and show uh, quickly, uh, maybe Genesis 1, 26 through 31 and Luke 1, 26 through 27. Because when Joshua came in, he was fulfilling what was written in the law and the testimony. And so you can know through the scriptures what day he was born on. See, you can know that he was not born in the middle of winter. In fact, John the Baptist, who was burying dead Jews, was born in the winter. He was born in December. You can figure that out through reading the scriptures. All right. So Genesis 1, 26. Genesis 1 and 26. The Elohim said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Mm -hmm. And so Elohim created man in his own image and the image of Elohim created he him, male and female created he them. And okay, so, you know, one of the things you want to remember when you're reading this in Genesis, this is Moses's account of watching Yahweh Elohim in his vision. He's seeing Yahweh Elohim create the man on the sixth day. And he's recording it down just that way. What he saw him do on the sixth day. He did it according to six days in the vision that he gave to Moses because it had to be broken down. All right. It was one day, two day. You know how you, you have the days of creation in uh, Genesis, the first chapter, the whole thing is uh, the days of creation, the six days of creation. Okay, so anyway, he sees man come in on the sixth day. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. And if you read, I think, it is, I think it might be Exodus, I hope it's Exodus, the 19th chapter. 19 and 1. Exodus 19 and 1. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. Okay, now they... in the third month, the third month in, so this is the day that he's up there on the mountain. He's up there, he went up in June. In the third month, is, see your first month would have been April, May, June. So he went up in the third month. And he went up on June 3rd. And by the time he's seeing the, this, it's June 6th. So in, in, you have him coming in on the 6th. So it's June 6th that Moses sees. Do you see that? That's how you get the June 6th up there on the mountain. All right. So, uh, and then Yahshua the Messiah comes in. Let's get where he was born. I think it's Luke 1, 26 and 27. I'm not sure about these verses for sure, but I haven't looked at it in a while, but I think that's what it is. Uh, Luke 1, 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from Elohim unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David 
and the virgin's name was Mary. Okay, so the the virgin is gonna the angels come to Mary in the sixth month, which is September mm -hmm. in the Hebrew calendar, right? Right. Right? Everybody with me? That's gonna be September. Read. And to a virgin, a spouse, to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, Yahweh is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. Mm -hmm. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with Yahweh. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Yahshua. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and Yahweh Elohim shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Okay, what verse are you reading? Are you down to 30? That was 32. Oh, okay, that's good. That's all I wanted out of there. Okay. So what you have is you have, you have the, the, he's coming in September, so nine months after that, you know that he's going to be born in, in June, right? Mm -hmm. And because Adam came in on the 6th, you know that Yahshua is going to be born on the 6th day also, which is where you get your June 6th from. And June 6th is huge in, you know, in the, in the purpose. You have a lot of things happening on that. That was when Pentecost took place, June 6th. And Dr. Kinley used to make statements like about nine o'clock in the morning. And, you know, he knew the, the time that things happened. Thank you, I see your sign. And all, all the things that happened with, um, you know, the, the way that the, the timing went and stuff. So anyway, it, let's go back to this ages for a minute and just talk about um, the things that are happening at the end of this age. So one of the things that you see here with, and, and, you know, you have, you, you, we can talk about Christmas from now till Christmas. <laughs> it's coming up here very soon. You can't really escape it every year. I try it, but it doesn't always work, you know. Um, it's, it's really amazing, though, how that you have uh, so many places now where you can read stuff about where the, um, kind of lost for words but uh where all your holiday traditions and stuff come from and they know that they came from paganism and stuff made up and even uh terrible things you know <laughs> things you can't even imagine worshiping you know and um and it's right out there in the world. I mean, you can read it on the internet at this time of year, they even bring stuff up. And then at the very end of stuff, they'll bring up something about um, paganism and how bad it was. And this is how this tradition came in. And, and then at the very end of it, but we still do it because we like it. We realize it's just a Christmas tradition, you know, and that's the way everything just goes on and just, and, you know, one of the things that we always want to look at with understanding something and knowing something about Yahweh is we don't go along with something just because it's a tradition. We don't go along with things just because somebody said it that we have a great deal of respect for. We don't go along with things because things are okay, better for you in the world because you go along with them. And that's not just Christmas. It's all the things that we, because we are really different in the way that we operate, not just in the holidays, but on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, you can take, we don't keep a Sabbath day. We don't, all the, everything that has to do with religion, we don't do any of it from a natural standpoint. And we always want to remember why it is we're like that. Do we just like being different or why the, you know, Yahweh set things up so that you would be set apart. You know, that's what sanctified means and justified too. You're set apart from the way that they do things in the world. And we're not of this world. You know, we're in the world. We live in the world. We still are in a natural body and we still operate in this world, but we're not of it. We're not part of it. 
In fact, if you are what you ought to be, and I'm just quoting the way Dr. Kidley used to say it, if you are what you ought to be, you've been translated into the kingdom of Yahshua. And you now look at things from a very different point of view. It's as, it's as high above the heavens as the earth is, <laughs> you know, his, just like his thoughts are. And see, he's brought us into thinking the way that he does. Not completely, because we get a piecemeal and we got a long ways to go. You know, we get distracted easily and a lot of things happen with us. But we are definitely seeing things the way that he has shown us. And we can stick with it because we've been given all the tools to stay with the things that are true and honest in the teaching. And you can be just that way. And you have a witness for all the things that you get into. You have a reason why you don't celebrate Christmas, for example. And it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with people and you're not liking to do it or you're not liking to get together with people. It doesn't have anything to do with it. What it has to do with is, what does Yahweh think about it? <laughs> you know, what does Yahweh think about all the things that people do to entertain themselves in this world. Well, one of the things about us is, and, it, it, and we're, it's not that we're even above people. It's just that we've been given this great gift and we appreciate it. We're definitely not above people. I know a lot of people that do better than some of us do. You understand behaving themselves and all the stuff and it's just not even in the realm of talking about it. But you know, we have been given all these things to be grateful for, and we see things the way they are so clearly. And because we see things from an elevated point of view, which is his way of looking at it. And we always want to be grateful for the foundation that we were given, for the basics that we were given, and for this great teaching that's going on as long as it has. I mean, I certainly didn't expect to be as old as I'm getting. And I know some of us in here are in the same boat. And we didn't expect it, this to go on this way. But I'm grateful. I'm grateful, Yashua. It's not easy getting old, but you know what? I'll take whatever it is that he's dishing out because I know that I always have him to rely upon. I always have the consistency of this great teaching. And I, I hope that somebody got something out of what I had to say and brought out. All praises go to Yashua. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Snyder. And for our last speaker this evening, I'd like to call on Dr. Deb Kamati and Dr. Margaret Trevison will read. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. We've had, we've had a lot um, brought out tonight, and Yahshua has certainly been praised. And that is always our goal is to give the praise and the glory and the honor to Yahshua and, and not to ourselves or our our school, our you know, our greatest speakers, or you know, anything like that. It's always to um, give the praise to Yahshua, the Messiah. And um, I like when we read Jeremiah, the 10th chapter, um, it's so thought provoking and like scriptures, uh, speakers have said they never saw this scripture before in the book. And I would have the same testimony. Um, I knew about some of the events when I was in church, I knew about some of the events, like the obvious ones of like Noah, Noah and Jonah, but never did I see anything like uh, I seen here in Jeremiah, where it's talking about taking a tree and decorating it. And um, if we can just talk about that for a couple minutes, um, a lot of people have already brought it out uh, in different classes. We've been talking about this because it is this time of year that, you know, people don't care or even if they do know, they still, they still don't care or some people are under pressure and they just give in. 
Um, there's a lot of things going on. And you know what? I um, personally don't think anybody is going to the lake of fire for having a Christmas tree, but that's just me. Um, I, I don't have one, but I, I just think that um, sometimes there's things that are done and we, uh, with all the wisdom and the intelligence and the knowledge that Yahshua has given us, um, are able to discern what's, what's the what. And um, having said that, I want to just start, Scott, if you could just start in Jeremiah 10 and 1. He's talking about the way of the heathens. And um, he's saying what they do with these trees. And we certainly do see... You know, we see the, the trees being cut down and we see them on the top of cars and we see people making a big deal. Some people have them in every single room in their house. Uh, I used to work with a girl, her brother, you know, had, a, had trees up all year long. It just, you know, it's just whatever you can think of, they've, they've done it. So go ahead. Jeremiah 10 and 1. Hear ye the word which Yahweh speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith Yahweh, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For now, the why, can I just ask one question, Scott? Why are they dismay, dismayed at the signs of heaven? Okay. Now, what I'm thinking and probably ricky can chime in if this isn't correct but what i'm thinking is that they have seen the time of the year where the sun it got you know the, the days got shorter right. and the people the people got nervous and and they wanted to do things um like for fertility and for worship and so they in their own minds took it you know upon themselves to say you know we got to do something here and um they were dismayed at the signs of heaven being the shortness of the days and um hoping that you know the sun would come back and they recognized that they you know the sun and the days uh you know to bring vegetation and to bring uh life to the world they recognized so they were dismayed when they saw the days get shorter has a lot of accuracy to it. Yeah. Has a lot of what, Rick? Accuracy. Okay, thank you. Was that Ricky or Greg? It was Rick. Okay, thank you, Rick. Okay, so we'll go, we'll read three. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it in them to do good. So in the, in the tree itself, don't be afraid of it. it. It can't do evil or good, but it's what you're doing in your heart and in your mind when you're doing these kind of things. And it doesn't have to be a Christmas tree in December. It could be anything at any time if it's taken the spot of the praise of Yahshua in your heart and in your mind. Go ahead, Scott. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Yahweh, Thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee doth it appertain, for as much as among all the wise men of the nations, and in all their kingdoms, there is none like unto thee. There, there is none like unto thee. Now, the thing that's amazing is that Yahweh, through the shape and form of Elohim gave visions and revelations to mankind. And it's already been talked about tonight and came down to that lesser state to 
communicate with man and to give him the facts of what was going on. And the reason that he showed himself as a cloud and not as a figure of something else in the sense of um, when he came down from Mount Sinai or when he was on Mount Sinai, he showed himself to be this fiery cloud. Now, when you look at the fiery cloud, okay, you cannot get a specific shape and a specific form. And that was the point that you would not make a graven image. Can I have Exodus, the 20th chapter, please? Mm -hmm. I mean, graven images are, are very, very big in religions and it doesn't even have to be a saint or a statue. I mean, it can be a, it can be a wailing wall. It can be a rock. It can be crystals. It can be going to a place in, I think it's Arizona, where they think all the high energies come and they think that's the highest point of spirit. These are all graven images in the sense of it's what man is trying to do with spirit rather than listening to what Yahweh as spirit is spirit has given to man. Okay. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, Dr. Kirby said, the law and the prophets were Yahweh's words to mankind. So mm -hmm. it's, it's really, really important in the sense of seeing where this stuff is going. Okay. So mm -hmm. go ahead. Exodus 20 and one. And Elohim spoke all these words saying, I am Yahweh the Elohim, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow thyself down to them nor serve them. For I, Yahweh the Elohim, am a jealous Elohim, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Okay, so he's saying, I'm a jealous Elohim, and so don't have any graven images. And he really covers it because he does nothing that's in the air, you know, no birds or no nothing like that, no beasts, and nothing that's in the sea. And you you can see from the other nations how they did not have Yahweh telling them what was what. So with their imagination, they came up with uh, beasts that they worshiped. And we've been talking a, re a real lot about beasts and people would look at something that they thought was very strong and they would uh, use that as part of their idol. And then they would put a man's head on it. And they would just do all kinds of things, but none of it was anything that was um, anything more than man's imagination. And, you know, we've been talking about that with um, man's imagery and as many people as are on the earth is as many imaginations as you could have about what, what gives them pleasure, what they think there's power derived from, what they think uh, will help them along or help them feel better. And so um, we're talking about Yahweh giving people a vision and a revelation. And these other gods just didn't do that. And if you see where they're talking about up above, where they're talking about the tree, it said, they must needs be born because they can't even move. And you find where you had to carry these, some of these gods around. And I think it's Buddha right now. You have to carry him from his summer home to his winter home. They have to carry the idol because he can't get up and go himself because he's nothing more than their image. It's, it's wood, it's stone. It's, you know, graven out of gold even, but it's nothing that's alive. Yahweh mm -hmm. Elohim, our Yahshua is alive. He's a quickening spirit mm -hmm. in our hearts and in our minds. And that's where we're drawing the line of demarcation saying, you know, 
this is what we're talking about. This is who we praise. And I think you heard that tonight, talking about the name of Yahshua and talking why it's not Jesus. And it does matter because if you stick with Jesus, you're not going to get the full understanding of the Godhead. See, you got to understand those true names to see that Godhead. But go ahead. Jeremiah or... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead and, and Jeremiah, it's the eighth chapter or verse. Okay, Jeremiah 10 and 8. But they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. And because they and they're putting so much of themselves into this. And like if you uh, read in other places, um, the reason I said I don't think you're going to the lake if you have a Christmas tree is if like say you you understand it doesn't do anything because some people when they put that tree up and they make such a big deal out of it and they spend so much money, they're actually thinking they're doing something for the worship of the baby Jesus. And when you when you explain that to them, and I know this happened in our family, when you explain to them that it's, you know, a worshiping of the Jesus and carrying on, they said, well, no, it isn't. It just looks pretty. But then you have the nativity set under the tree and people get really, really into the spending of money for this great nativity set. And what's that? That's the baby Jesus in the manger. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to pull in all these things to pull in all these people to ultimately get them to worship Jesus at this time. Most people go to church at Christmas and they spend money. And that's what it's really always boils down to is the merchandise. And that's the mystery of iniquity. Okay. Mm -hmm. So my book says they're altogether stupid. And that's what I say is stupid and foolish because how much does, how much money does that cost for nothing to put up a tree, to deck it, to do all that work. And then now there's certain ways that you can recycle. If you have a real tree, there's certain ways that you can recycle it. So it just goes on and on and on. So it says they're stupid and they're foolish. So there you go. Go ahead. Silver spread into plates is brought from Tarshish and gold from Uphaz, the work of the workmen and of the hands of the founder. Blue and purple is their clothing. They are all the work of cunning men. But Yahweh is the true Elohim. He is the living owl and an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble and the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. So see, after he's gone through all this stuff about, you know, having something get in your way that's in front of Yahweh, in front of your heart being dedicated to Yahweh, after getting through all that, then they, uh, Jeremiah is saying, Yahweh is the true Elohim, okay? And the reason Jeremiah knows that, um, can we go over to Second uh, Peter 1, 20 and 21, please? See, these people... They weren't just talking, they were moved. They were inspired to say these things. Uh, let's read it. Second Peter 1, 21. For the prophecy came not hey, pick in- it up. I'm sorry, Peggy, pick it up in 20. 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of Yahweh spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. See, so holy men of Yahweh, and this is uh, what Jeremiah is. He's a holy man of Yahweh, and he's speaking as the Holy Spirit moves him. So mm -hmm. now he is declaring that Yahweh is the true Elohim. And you just would not understand, like I said, once again, uh, I'm going to have to have Scott go to John 1 and 1. But if you understand those names it's not lord is the true god it's not that it's yahweh is the true elohim and he's everlasting so that means right now today he's still on the throne 
but it's not physical. It's not in Jerusalem. It's not at the Wailing Wall. It's not, I think they got a rock somewhere in the most holy place now or something. I don't know. It's none of that. But he is sitting on a throne and it's the throne of your heart. And that's what we're talking about. That spirit being within you. And we were talking the other night about the kingdom. And that's over in Luke, that the kingdom is within you. So when we talk about the kingdom being at hand, the kingdom is within you. It's the Holy Spirit in you. And it's far more powerful and far greater than any tree you're going to put up and try to worship with a little nativity set underneath it. So go ahead. You got John one and one? Please. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with Yahweh, and the word was Yahweh. Okay, so in the beginning, okay, now what is the, what are we talking about? What, where are we? In the beginning, where, where is that? See, it's, if you understand, and, and most of us didn't understand until we got here and got some understanding, if you understanding in the beginning is in the beginning of Yahweh's purpose, where he is going to bring forth this whole purpose and plan of salvation, okay? We just didn't know anything about this stuff in the church because they don't know anything about it to tell us. So Dr. Kinley didn't know anything about it until Yahweh Elohim tells him and then says, teach my people, which is what Dr. Kinley went forth to do for the rest of his life on this earth was to set up the school and to preach the gospel, which we've talked about, the death, burial, resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah, according to the scriptures, to teach the people the good news that you are going to have your soul saved, okay? It's not going to be lost. There is good news, just like with Noah. It's going to rain. The earth is going to flood out. But listen, this ark floats. This ark can save you. You got to get in the ark. And you know what? Eight people got in that ark and they're the eight that were supposed to be in there. You cannot overthink it. It's just like right now, whoever's in class and whoever's in the body of Yahshua, the Messiah are the ones that are supposed to be there. And, and that's the way it is. And Yahshua is going to bring in who he wants and he's going to leave outside the ark who he doesn't want. And that's just the way it's going. That Holy Spirit closed that door. So even if there was somebody that was on the ramp, the eighth were in there, that, that door was shut by the Holy Spirit, and that was it. And you cannot overthink it because it's Yahweh's purpose, and he is absolute pure justice, okay? So now, here's Scott, and he's reading, in the beginning was the word. Now, if you see up at the top of the chart, you see where Moses, he's in white, and you see that white painted there, it says panoramic vision of, Mo, of Elohim to Moses. That's what we're talking about. Moses is seeing this Elohim. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with Yahweh and the word was Yahweh. So that's why I said, if you don't get the name straight and you want to hang on to Jesus, it is going to impede your understanding of what's working here. This is Yahweh. Elohim so it's not Lord over here and it's not God over here and it's not Jesus over here if you look on this shape and form it says right on it Yahweh Elohim and Yahshua all three are right on that figure that Moses is seeing so it's a unity and that's what John was understanding when he wrote what he wrote here Perfect. You see that where Moses is looking, see how the white's painted. It's letting you know, it's like a vision. Moses is looking and he sees this form and it says, see where Greg's circling it? It says Yahweh. It says Elohim and it says Yahshua all on the same figure. So you're not going to get a Trinity out of that. It's impossibility. See, it's saying Yahweh the word was with Yahweh, the word being Elohim. The word was with Yahweh, see Yahweh at the top of the figure. And the word was Yahweh. So there's no duality. There's no trinity. 
this is one deity that we're talking about. So if you, re if you can research that name of Jesus, you're going to see what we're talking about. If you cannot hang on to that and get the full picture of what this purpose and plan of salvation is. So people say, well, you know, a lot of things in my life have happened in the name of Jesus. I'm not going to try to take that away from you, but let's move on. Let's carry on. It's like, yes, when I was in kindergarten, two plus two was four, but you know what? When I had to take algebra classes, I couldn't just stay on two plus two is four. Now that carried me through that principle that brought me on, but you had to move on to what was more perfect. And Paul even talks about that with the baptism, with the Paul, Aquila and Priscilla. He said, I think it's them guys. He says, but let's move on to perfection. Let's move on. That was John's baptism with water, but let's move on to perfection. And that was the baptism with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So here we are, we're understanding the Godhead and we're trying to get a little bit out of this to understand why you're going to let go of Jesus. And it's a really hard time right now because they're saying it's the birth. And Bonnie just showed you December 25th, is it not even his birthday? And that was, I mean, that was such a, <laughs> that was such a shocker. But they make, they make so much sense just by saying stuff like the shepherds are out there with their sheep in the fields. Guess what? You don't do that in the winter. So it, it just so many things that we've been fooled on. And then you say, wow, I, that's amazing to me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find out what else Yahweh has let these people know. And it just goes on and goes on and goes on. And it's absolutely amazing. And we're still learning. We're still hearing things and we're still learning. And I think Rochelle, the first speaker said that, you know, still learning. And every day is something to learn. And Yashua doesn't let us down. And like she said, people in class and I didn't get nothing out of that. What are you crazy? You're going to get something every day. It's just like saying, I got up, I, you know, I woke up, I breathed the air, I made a cup of coffee. You already got something out of the day. Go ahead. The same was in the beginning with Yahweh. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Now, what John's saying here, listen, you got you to gotta include the mystery of iniquity right there. The mystery of iniquity has got to be included in... Yahweh Elohim made everything, and they already said, Yahweh, put Yahweh Elohim, shape and form of himself, and then he created everything, and he went out of the creating business, because, you know, if Yahweh stays in that pure spirit form, and he creates something, we don't, we don't see it, we don't get it, we don't understand it, so Yahweh Elohim, shape and form, vision and revelation, gets down to a level where he can show us. And that's what he does as the perfect creator, okay? So you got to put the mystery of iniquity in here. You can't leave him out and say that God would never do that because it's saying right here, everything that was made, Yahweh Elohim made. So he made that devil. Go ahead. In him was life and the life was the light of man. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. So in every single man, all mankind has the spirit of Yahweh Elohim him, in him. Right back from Adam, he showed you how he did it. He breathed into Adam and Adam became a living soul. And that's exactly how each one of us lives is by that spirit being in us, allowing us to be a living soul. Go ahead. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And the light shone in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Some books, my book says the darkness overcame it not. So guess what? Once you see something, and once Yahweh enlightens you, and he gives you something in your heart and in your mind, you're never going to go back to that darkness. You're never going to say, I can't know that, because you do know it. You're never going to say, oh, I forgot what it's 
that name was that they taught me. I think I'll go back to Jesus. You're not going to ever say that. The darkness cannot overcome the light. Okay. And you can see that every day when that sun comes out. Okay. All darkness is gone. The darkness will not overcome the light. And that's the same thing with once we know something, the darkness will not overcome it. And hallelujah, because who wants to be in darkness and confusion and chaos? There's enough of that in the world. Okay. So let me just see here, Scott. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted really that part. Oh, I know. Okay. So what I want you to do now, we talked about Yahweh. Now I'm still on that figure up there with Moses. We talked about Yahweh. And him, you know, and the word was with Yahweh and the word was Yahweh. Now we're going to bring in the figure on the cross just to show you it's a unity and not a trinity. Okay. And I've even read lately, I've even read some things that were on um, Google and uh, on YouTube. And they people have said that are, you know, like Christians, they've said, we know the trinity is not in the Bible. I thought that was pretty clever because I never heard that before. They said, but it's the Trinity because of the way he, you know, the way he existed or, you know, whatever he did, but they picked right up on it. Cause we have said for years and years and years in this school, Trinity is not even in your Bible, but guess what is unity. And I think Bonnie, she, um, she didn't have it read, but she uh, said that, you know, Deuteronomy 6 and 4, hear, O Israel, Yahweh, our Elohim, okay, is Yahweh a unity, mm -hmm. and it is critical, it is so critical, but let's pick up 14, so you can see Yahshua's in this mm -hmm. unity. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We beheld his glory. So that's what I was saying when I first started talking about that the glory and the praise has been given to Yahshua. And that's why we're on these Zoom classes, is to preach the gospel and to tell the truth. And we've been talking a lot about uncovering the hidden things of dishonesty. Okay, so we've uncovered the Christmas tree and we've uncovered how it's the name is not Jesus. And we've uncovered that the gospel is death, burial, resurrection of Yahshua, according to the scriptures, because if you're in church, they're going to say the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And those are long books. Those are long chapters to get through. And how do you get, how do you break that down? How do you, you know, get that summary? But when you see over in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, it says, Paul declares the gospel. It's the death. It's the burial. It's the resurrection of Yahshua, the Messiah, according to the scriptures. And that's why I said earlier that Dr. Kinley had said uh, the scriptures, first of all, are the law and the prophets, and that they are the words that Yahweh has given to his people. Now, the Bible in itself is not the word of God because I just showed you who the word is and that's Yahweh Elohim. Mm -hmm. But these are the, these, are, say it again. Okay, sorry. These are the words that he gave. And when you get in there and you start to read those stories and you see how Yahweh, I think it's in Chronicles, there was gonna be a big battle and Yahweh, told the children of Israel, I have already given the Mol Molinax or Molites or I've already, Mol Moabites, I've already given the Moabites into your hand, but you have got to show up for the battle. And the people had to go to the battle. They could not just wait for Yahweh to wipe those Moabites out. They had to show up for the battle and Yahweh did what he said he'd do. So you can see a principle of Yahweh taking care of his sons and his daughters. Okay. The battle was already won and he had declared it to him. And that's what I'm declaring to you right now. The battle has already been won. Yahshua the Messiah in our hearts and in our minds 
has let us know the darkness cannot overcome us. No matter mm -hmm. what's going on, and I, I can hear the pain and people's voices, there's a lot going on. But when we know Yahshua is in our hearts and in our minds, he is the, uh, I'm going to have uh, Peggy go back to the scripture. Peg, go back and read 10 and 10. When we know this, 10. Mm -hmm. But Yahweh is the true Elohim. He's the living Elohim and an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble and the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. He is everlasting. Now, when you get married and you take vows that you're going to, you know, be with each other to the end, you know, it's your hope. If you're, you know, if you're sincere, it's your hope that that is, that that is what will happen. But, you know, we really just don't have, you know, you just don't have any um, control sometimes over, over what happens. But that's why this is so different here where he's saying that he's everlasting. See, um, I just want to go over and have Scott, this will be uh, the end part here. Uh, Scott, go to Hebrews 7, and we're talking about our high priest now, Yahshua the Messiah. Now remember, it said over there in Jeremiah that he was our, our everlasting living king and Elohim. Okay, so Scott, go over there now and read 7, and um, let me see here. Okay. Uh, let me see. Try 23. I only got a couple minutes. In Hebrews 7 and 23. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto Elohim by him, seeing as he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Okay, so wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. I thought we just read back there in Jeremiah that Yahweh Elohim was everlasting. He's the living. He's the king. Now we're talking about Yahshua. So do you see how confusing that would be if you're still hanging on to Jesus right now? But mm -hmm. if you understand that Yahshua is Yahweh Elohim coming down into a physical body to do a job. And then he goes, he takes off the flesh and he sits on the right hand of the father. So then when it's saying that he is an everlasting king and high priest, then you don't have any trouble with it because you understand the Godhead and you understand how he is and pure spirit and intermediate and concrete form. Go ahead, Scott. For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Okay, so to... good thing that he's separate from sinners because we're looking to him to save our souls because we know we were sinners. Now, you would not go to... A, if you were on the streets homeless, you would not go to another homeless person and ask for money or something to eat because you guys are both in a bad way. But Yahshua, if we're sinners, we've got to see Yahshua as someone with no sin, no blemish, no spot. And we're now we're going to look to him to save our souls. And that is what's taken place. And I hope and trust that somebody got something out of what was said that Yahshua he certainly has been praised tonight. His name is holy and it's important. And if you just do a little, little bit of research, you can find that, like they said, there was no J at the time that Yahshua was on the scene. So his name, when he's on the scene, they were not, the disciples were not calling him Jesus. So it's thought provoking. Check it out. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Dr. Kometi. May I conclude our class for this evening? I'd like to thank everyone that uh, came into our Zoom room and also those that are viewing us on YouTube. We do um, have Zoom class every Wednesday and we'll be live streamed to YouTube. 
so please join us. Um, <clears throat> We'll end the class with doxology taken from the last two verses of the book of Jude, the Holy Name Bible. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless in the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time, now and ever. Let the class say, hallelujah. Hallelujah.